good evening friends uh, i will be talking today about managing uh, comorbidities in heart failure and uh, as we all know that uh, the outcomes of any disease just not depend on the treatment of that particular disease but so many times there are so many comorbidities which are there so we have to manage them well uh, in order to have good outcomes and one of the very important disease uh, which requires a very good management of comorbidities is heart failure so why heart failure is important because uh, the burden of heart failure is quite a lot if we look here that uh, the number of patients worldwide of heart failure are quite significant and in our country also it is a large number of people who have heart failure the economic burden also on the society is quite a lot and also something which is very sinister about heart failure is that about 50% of the patients once they are diagnosed to have heart failure would be dead within 5 years of diagnosis so this makes it one of the worst possible disease with a poor prognosis and sometimes the outcomes of heart failure today are uh, despite all the advancement of therapies is even bleak than many malignancies as such now there are two associated problems of heart failure one is the increased burden which is increased morbidity and mortality which is characterized by rehospitalization and in people more than 65 years it is the number one cause of hospitalization the uh, comorbidities are also present in large majority of patients with heart failure there are many patients who have three or more uh, comorbidities on the course of their disease of heart failure so there are many associated comorbidities in heart failure which impact the prognosis the first one being the copd which is not uncommon because so many times many of such patients have breathlessness per se and sometimes patients who have heart failure are getting treated by the chest physicians for copd and many times patients with copd are also referred to cardiologists for heart failure therapy and certain tests can really help us to the diagnosis fast and treat them better the most important is the use of uh, various biomarkers such as antipro bnp which can help us guide through many heart failure patients also have hypertension angina many of them have renal dysfunction some of them have gout hyperlipidemia and also iron deficiency which is not uncommon many heart failure patients have depression sleep disturbances which can also disturb their daily routine and also worsen the outcomes coexistence of diabetes mellitus is very common and also obesity anemia which are not uncommon in this so why comorbidities are relevant in heart failure the first most important thing is that whenever there are associated comorbidities it is associated with poor clinical status and uh, these comorbidities are predictors of poor prognosis so many times patient takes certain drugs for the comorbidities which can worsen uh, the heart failure and also some of the medicines taken for comorbidities may interact and reduce patient adherence or may interact and worsen the outcomes for example certain drugs can help for example hgl2 inhibitors in diabetes mellitus have been shown to improve outcomes in heart failure also so this is something which we must uh, keep in mind and also we know that the use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in comorbidities such as osteoarthritis gout or any kind of musculoskeletal disorders can blunt the effect of uh, diuretics and worsen the patients also so there have been various uh, big heart failure 
guidelines which are there for treatment. There was one ACC expert consensus statement which was issued in 2017. And this expert consensus pathway which was released, it basically tried to answer the 10 pivotal issues with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And it talked about how to optimize the therapies in such patients. And these uh, 10 principles for successful treatment of heart failure were basically the first most important part of this was how to implement the guideline directed medical therapy. So the first part is to initiate and switch and uh, the treatment algorithm for guidelines directed medical therapy including novel therapies should be there in place and should be accessible and number two which is very important is that once we have initiated the guideline directed medical therapy like in patients of heart failure the use of ASARBs or uh, MRAs beta blockers or ARNI which is according to the guideline Inland directed medical therapy. Now it requires titration of doses. If the patient continue to be on certain dosage of therapy like beta blockers, they need to achieve it and reach the optimum target dosages, whichever are recommended by the guidelines. Then there are various other uh, challenges which are there uh, with heart failure, like triggers for referral to a heart failure specialist for a general physician. Then uh, this also requires some amount of coordination in the various caregivers, which is the heart failure nurse or any other caregiver, which is important. Another important aspect regarding the challenging with the therapy is the adherence. It is very important to make sure that the therapies are adhered and also the interventions for adherence need to be given. Maybe these days there are apps available which help us to remind the patients for taking their medicines regularly or just simply telling patients to keep a record of their blood pressure and daily weight and which can be sms probably every week in, or maybe certain apps can be utilized can help such patients then in certain specific patient cohorts it is very important that uh, the assessment of the risk factors should be considered the cost of care is also very important then to manage the heart failure it is increasingly complex specifically the hefref the hefref has various complex pathophysiologies the management of comorbidities is also a huge challenge and is a major thrust area if you want to improve the outcomes of the patient and then in the patients who are admitted, palliative care or the hospitalized patient care also plays a significant role in many patients. There are various uh, cardiac comorbidities which can coexist with HEFREF and which can impact the outcomes in such patients. Uh, the coronary artery disease is one of the very important cardiac uh, comorbidity. It has a strong association with heart failure and there is a huge uh, evidence which is based on clinical trials which is there and it is suggested that in any patient who comes with HEFREF we must try and rule out coronary artery disease if there is no history of coronary artery disease present even then we should consider a large number of these patients as to be candidates of underlying coronary artery disease and many times doing an echocardiogram can also help us in picking up the regional wall motion abnormalities and sometimes doing an angiogram becomes important. The atrial fibrillation is again associated with poor outcomes and it is very important to treat atrial fibrillation whenever it is present along with HFREF and it should be treated according to the set guidelines we must focus on rate control use of optimum oral anticoagulation strategy whenever it is required then the treatment of mitral regurgitation this is also very important and many times 
the outcomes of patients in HEFREF is dependent on the way mitral regurgitation is treated. And we must uh, follow the guidelines of structural heart disease according to the ACCAHA and also follow the guideline directed medical therapy regarding this. Similarly, aortic stenosis has got a strong association with heart failure and treating aortic stenosis also has a great impact in improving outcomes with HFREF. Hypertension, we do know long-standing hypertension has an association with heart failure and if we want to prevent HFREF, we need to treat hypertension early and appropriately. And again, there should be, this should be guideline directed treatment. Dyslipidemia, we are not sure whether it has got a direct link or not. We are uncertain of association with heart failure. But prevention can help in many of the patients. Peripheral vascular disease, there is moderate association with heart failure. And this should also be treated according to guidelines. And also the cerebrovascular disease, although there is a moderate association. The evidence is weak for treatment of these, but this should again be treated according to the guidelines. There are certain non-cardiac comorbidities which are very common with HFF, one of them being uh, chronic uh, lung disease. And uh, that has got a strong association. And also we must optimize the therapy and also consider pulmonary consultation in many of these patients. Then regarding obesity, there is an inverse association which has been described somewhere, but we're not sure that uh, treating obesity, does it improve heart failure or not? The evidence is not very robust as far as this comorbidity is concerned. Regarding diabetes mellitus, there is a very strong overwhelming data in clinical trials, there is overwhelming data in therapy areas and this needs to be treated early and properly. And we know that we need to optimize treatment of diabetes early. We should consider the use of certain group of drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors. Avoid the use of certain drugs such as pioglitazone in many of these patients. Then regarding chronic renal disease, there is a strong correlation with outcomes and also we must consider optimizing the RAS therapy in these patients and maybe if required offer dialysis after the consultation of a nephrologist with these patients. Association of anemia with heart failure is also there which is quite significant and if the hemoglobin is very low transfusing uh, blood to them or uh, giving the Fat cell concentrate improves the outcomes in large number of patients. One of the very emerging areas in treatment of HFREF has been iron deficiency. And all patients who have evidence of iron deficiency should be given intravenous iron. Thyroid disorders also has a big comorbidity in heart failure patients and uh, it needs to be treated optimally. Sleep apnea syndrome or the sleep uh, disorders do have a correlation. And by doing a sleep study, we can pick up the abnormalities. And if required, these patients improve a lot if you put them on any kind of BiPAP or CPAP whenever it is recommended. So as far as the treatment of heart failure is concerned, there are principles of management. The first and the most important principle is to treat the congestion which is done by the diuretic, then we must treat the risk factors, hypertension, coronary artery disease, treat the comorbidities, anemia, CKD, COPD, and the others, diabetes, and also target the neurohormonal activation. So this is something which is very important, and we have a lot of evidence from various trials regarding this. In dealing with the comorbidities with heart failure, one of the very prominent uh, therapy areas is the iron deficiency. This is a comorbidity that goes 
unnoticed in heart failure many times a large number of our patients have iron deficiency which is quite prevalent but it is quite often neglected because it is not looked for i'll be presenting some data here to emphasize the treatment of iron deficiency so why treating iron deficiency is important because we know that uh, up to about 50% of our patients have iron deficiency 50% of heart failure patients do have iron deficiency and this is present worldwide the evidence from various countries such as india it is close to about 80 to 85% of our patients whatever small studies we have about 80 to 85% of our patients with hfrep have iron deficiency and the country wise prevalence of iron deficiency is like in united states of america it's about 61.3 and in studies from europe it is somewhere between 37 to 50% in singapore one of the study quoted about 61.4 and in singapore indians it was about 82% so there is an alarming burden of iron deficiency with heart failure in india and it is uh, postulated that about 8 to 10 million individuals are affected by heart failure in india and out of that about 3 out of 4 have iron deficiency so which means that about 6 to 8 million patients of congestive heart failure have iron deficiency in india so which is huge and just by improving their iron status we can improve their outcomes So considering this, uh, the EHC came out with the heart failure guidelines for treatment of iron deficiency in heart failure. And uh, what it noted was that iron deficiency in patients with heart failure is very common and is an important comorbidity irrespective of presence of anemia. Many of these patients may or may not have anemia at all. It is just the iron deficiency which might be there and they have decreased exercise performance, impaired health quality of life, and usually they have the worst prognosis many a times. The ESC guidelines recommend that all patients of heart failure should be screened for iron deficiency. Now, this should be done on basis of their serum ferritin and uh, the iron saturation, the transferrin saturation levels. Now, if the serum ferritin level is less than 100, so that means that there is iron deficiency. Or if the serum ferritin is less than 300, but transferrin saturation is less than 20%, these are the patients who have iron deficiency. Now, there is uh, another thing which is very important in these patients that the guidelines recommend that this should be treated importantly now along with the various tests which we do in patients of heart failure like hemoglobin tlc dlc the uh, kidney profile the liver function test hpa1c so we must do serum ferritin and tsat tibc levels also so if we do ferritin and and TSAT uh, levels, then we can pick up iron deficiency and we can treat it accordingly. When the guidelines, the level of evidence is 1C in this. So in EHC 2016 heart failure guidelines, they recommended the intravenous ferric carboxymaltase to treat iron deficiency in HFREF. The treatment of iron deficiency is based on the intravenous therapy and not the oral. The recommendations are class 2 and the intravenous ferric carboxymaltose should be given to the patients who have iron deficiency. And this recommendation is based on trial. There are two large trials which uh, have been published the fair hf and confirm hf which have shown that if we treat these patients with intravenous iron then the outcomes improve 
Now, these uh, studies were published in 2016 and before. Now, after this uh, guidelines, which were published in 2016, two more guidelines have come. Effect HF with ferrous uh, carboxymaltose and iron out with uh, oral iron, which have also come about. So the meta-analysis of individual patients uh, with ferrous carboxymaltase studies uh, is also available. And uh, if we see this, this is something very important, which is shows that not just it improves the outcomes, it improves various parameters significantly. It improves the CV hospitalization and uh, CV death. It improves the parameter of heart failure hospitalization and CV death. The CV hospitalization and all cause death, heart failure hospitalization and all cause death. And also the heart failure hospitalizations and CV hospitalizations are reduced when ferrous carboxymaltose is given to the patients. So there is an algorithm which is available for diagnosis and treatment and follow up of iron deficiency in these patients. So all patients who are having HFREF and are in NYHA class two to four, the first step is to check their iron deficiency status. We look at their iron levels, the ferritin levels less than 100. And if the ferritin is less than 300 and TSAT is uh, less than 20%, we check their anemia status and we treat them for their iron deficiency. This is something which is very important. And a single dose of ferrous carboxymaltase should be given to correct the iron in these patients. And this is based on the body weight of the patients. As far as the kidney disease is concerned, this is also a very important uh, comorbidity. And there is a lot of interaction with heart failure and uh, both in acute and the chronic setting there is a mounting data which indicates a complex interplay between heart and kidney and uh, which we uh, cardiologists and the nephrologists describe as a cardiorenal syndrome whereby the worsening of heart failure and kidney dysfunction go hand in hand and impairment in either of these two can lead to by induction of various inflammation or uh, cellular immune system or metabolic disorders, anemia, another thing, it can impact the outcomes of the other disorder as well. So if both heart failure and CKD coexist, then the outcomes in patients is quite poor. And the all cause CKD and the mortality risk associated in these patients can be seen here. A word about chronic kidney disease in the present circumstances. The CKD is now a pandemic and it affects more than 16% of adult population. CKD is a common comorbidity with heart failure. The coexistence of heart failure with CKD will increase the toxic manifestation of various diagnostic and therapeutic measures. It accelerates the atherosclerosis, increases the risk of death. And what we know is that more than 40% of heart failure patients have CKD and there is a close relationship between CKD and heart failure, which uh, worsens the outcomes in these patients. Regarding treatment with AS inhibitors, now this is, and the RAS system blockers, this is something which is very important, which we must know, that one of the very important therapy areas for treatment of heart failure which has been a great breakthrough has been uh, the treatment with ACE, ARB or the RB. And we know that the ACE and ARB are the drugs if used earlier, they prevent the complication related with the kidney disease. And as far as ARNI is concerned, the renal safety on top of all this therapy when compared with enalapril, it did show that it was better than the enalapril, the LCZ696, which is uh, the combination of valsartan and scabitril. 
So this the LCZ696 molecule compared to enalapril causes less increase in serum creatinine levels, as we can see here. And also, there was a numerically lower incidence of renal dysfunction in patients who were on this uh, ARNI in CKD as compared to the enalapril. So, in fact, uh, the beneficial effect of all ROS drugs is seen, but the maximum beneficial effect is seen of ARNI in this group of categories. And specifically, we must keep this in mind that we must use optimal dosages of ARNI and treat it properly. Now, as far as uh, the estimated changes in the glomerular filtration rate, the ACE versus ARNI, now this is also showed a great beneficial effect of using ARNI. And uh, as compared to nalapril, the scabital valsartan led to a slower rate of decrease in EGFR and improved the cardiovascular outcomes, in, even in patients who had uh, chronic kidney disease. So even with patients who have chronic kidney disease, you should not be afraid of using this group of drugs if they have heart failure because it improves the outcomes. And we have evidence that in this group of drugs also, rather than ACRB, uh, the best outcomes are seen with ARNI compared to all these drugs. And the combination of valsartan scabutrin scores here also. Now, another very important uh, therapy area in treatment of heart failure and which is an area of concern to all of us, specifically when patients are using MRAs also along with therapy, is hyperkalemia. And uh, ARNI also has an advantage over the enalapril as far as hyperkalemia is concerned. The risk of hyperkalemia associated with the use of MRAs was lower among those in I, who were on LCZ-696 as compared to those who were treated with enalapril. And uh, the, as we can see here, the increase in the potassium level of and with enalapril compared with SIDMAS, we can see here clearly that there's an advantage of using LCZ-696. And as we can see here, that uh, it did show a great advantage of using this combination, the ARNI drugs, over the ACE inhibitors as far as hyperkalemia is concerned. Now, whenever we are treating, I was one of the principal investigators for paradigm heart failure study. And I used this drug uh, in that and also been part of various trials, ongoing trials also with ARNI. And I'm certain that one of the very big area of therapy and which is of concern to us is hyperkalemia. And with ARNI, and if used judiciously along with other drugs, hyperkalemia can easily be managed easily. Also, there have been other studies, and there has been one year follow up study which does talk of changes in the EGFR and changes in the serum potassium. This study also mirrored the earlier studies and has shown that the favorable effect of ARNI. Now, one of the big blockbuster comorbidity in heart failure is diabetes because we know that if a patient has diabetes he has an increased chance of heart failure and vice versa if a patient has heart failure he has increased chance of diabetes so we know that that about 50 percent of patients who have diabetes will develop heart failure and many times a large number of these patients who have heart failure they, because of the problems, you know, uh, because they have heart failure, they have very high mortality and the five-year survival is less. And patients who have diabetes and due to heart failure, they have increased recurrent hospitalizations, they have poor quality of life and they have higher uh, mortality. The impact of diabetes and congestive heart failure is bidirectional at the molecular level. Diabetes itself causes altered uh, free fatty acid metabolism. It impairs the cardiac myocyte calcium sensitivity. It can cause the microvascular dysfunction. 
it also causes neuro hormonal abnormalities it affects the cardiac autonomic dysfunction and per se the diabetes can also cause hyperglycemic cellular damage so these are the various mechanisms whereby diabetes can create problem for the cardiac myocytes and ultimately lead to heart failure and what all these mechanisms lead to is impaired left ventricular contract contractile function relaxation abnormalities increased fibrosis left ventricular hypertrophy myocyte necrosis endothelial dysfunction and altered myocyte myocyte metabolism so all these things go hand in hand in developing heart failure and in other way patients who have heart failure they have much increased insulin resistance and hyperglycemia this increased insulin resistance and hyperglycemia can trigger all these mechanisms of which i have listed 1 to 6 here and this is a vicious circle which is completed of diabetes triggering heart failure and heart failure triggering diabetes so it is not uncommon to have both of these hand in hand so one of the very promising drugs today which is available is the sglt2 inhibitors and this new promising drug sglt2 inhibitors act in patients of diabetes with heart failure although various uh, mechanisms have been postulated like fuel shift the sodium co transporter uh, reduction in the interstitial volume then some people have talked about uh, increased hematocrit also but what we know certainly is that sglt2 does help in a great way by various mechanisms now as far as the heart failure is concerned it is reduction of the interstitial volume which really helps these patients and also the sglt2 inhibitors per se reduce the glucotoxicity they reduce the blood pressure and the body weight the risk of various cv events is further reduced by the use of heart failure so according to the ada uh, 2020 guidelines the sglt2 is a preferred oha in type 2 diabetes patients with atherosclerotic uh, cvd heart failure or ckd the first line therapy in these patients is metformin and the comprehensive uh, lifestyle management which includes the weight control and control of physical activity so once this is taken care of we look at the indicators of high risk in diabetes for example patients who have atherosclerotic cvd or patients who have ckd or patients who have heart failure so in patients who have atherosclerotic cvd and especially those who are obese we must consider using glp1 rays in such patients and uh, we can also consider the use of sglt2 inhibitors in patients in such patients and the sglt2 inhibitors which have proven benefit should be used in such uh, group of patients only but if the heart failure or the ckd Uh, predominance then uh, we have evidence from various trials large trials like amper uh, amperec trial the canvas trial so on and so forth we have so many trials which are there which have shown that outcomes regarding heart failure and ckd are better with sglt2 inhibitors and they are the preferred drugs the sglt2 inhibitors should be used specifically those which have been proven to sh show improvement in heart failure and also those who have ckd as well the ehc 2016 guidelines do talk of use of various sglt2 inhibitors in treatment of heart failure and all the three uh, currently available internationally uh, sglt2 inhibitors the ampa dapa glyphosate and the cana glyphosate can be used in this uh, treatment so we have also have uh, the evidence regarding the use of uh, 
one of the very important drugs. Now, this is the SGLT2 inhibitor being used as a heart failure drug, not as a drug uh, for diabetes, but as a heart failure drug. Now, this is something which came about just in near, uh, and what it showed was that the dapagliflozin, when used for heart failure, primarily not as a diabetes drug, but used for heart failure, had a significant improvement in heart failure composites. Now, what were the composites studied in the DAPA-HF study? Here, this drug, dapagliflozin, is being used as a heart failure drug, not as a diabetic drug. And the patients with or without diabetes were taken in this study. The primary composite outcome of CV death, heart failure hospitalization, were studied. And what it showed was that dapagliflozin reduces this primary composite of CV death, heart failure hospitalization in many of these patients. And also, it also shows that uh, the all cause death was less in such patients. In this trial, the quality of life was also studied regarding the cancer city questionnaire, and it did show significant improvement. So this has been a game changer drug as far as the heart failure therapy is concerned. Now this is regarding HEFREF. Regarding HEFREF, the evidence is still to come. So among patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and worsening heart failure or death from cardiovascular cause, this drug should be used. And I would like to add on here that just about four days back, the US FDA has given clearance for treatment of dapagliflozin in patients of HEFREF. Now, this is with or without diabetes, the use of dapagliflozin as a primary drug for heart failure. So many patients ask me that if you have a patient of heart failure, many doctors also, physicians also question me that, would you like to give SGLT2 inhibitors or ARNI? The answer is very simple. ARNI is the basic drug which forms the pillar of guideline-directed medical therapy. So all these drugs have to be given. And on top of it, if you give SGLT2 inhibitors, the outcomes further improve. This is another algorithm which has been proposed by the cardiologist. And this is regarding the treatment of diabetes in heart failure. And it talks about what drugs to be given and what drugs are not to be given. Now, if, if the patient has heart failure and established type 2 diabetes and the HPA1C is more than 7 despite metformin therapy, the recommended drug or the preferred drug to reduce uh, the CV outcomes is the SGLT2 inhibitor, which is there. And this has a potential of reduction in CV mortality and heart failure. Now, those patients who are at a very high risk of atherosclerotic CVD, we can consider use in GLP-1 RA drugs, a group of drugs can be used. But a word of caution is required in, patient, in patients who have heart failure. So we must be careful and use only those which are approved in use of heart failure. Regarding DPP-4 inhibitors, they are more or less neutral, but a couple of DPP-4 inhibitors have been cautioned in the use of heart failure. They should not be used. And one group of drug which should not be used is the thiazolidines, which should be absolutely not used. The clitazones, they increase the risk of heart failure tremendously. So just to summarize, we know that uh, comorbidities are very frequent when we treat heart failure. They should be recognized and treated appropriately. They should not be overlooked during the routine management of congestive heart failure. If we treat heart failure properly, then we also have to treat comorbidities if we have to improve the outcomes. But why we need to treat comorbidities? Because comorbidities such as iron deficiency, such as kidney disease, such as diabetes have a great impact on hospitalizations and mortality. And we can improve the outcomes of patients by treating this. The most important comorbidity in heart failure patients are renal insufficiency, diabetes, COPD, sleeping disorders like uh, obstructive sleep, apnea, and anemia. They all should be looked at 
with the very uh, importantly probing eyes and specifically the iron deficiency anemia this needs to be treated and the iron deficiency might be there even without anemia so we must look at iron deficiency even if the hemoglobin is normal and there is evidence that if we treat this the outcomes improve managing comorbidities especially in heart failure is very essential as it plays an integral role in heart failure progression and in response to treatment thank you so much for your kind attention so we have a couple of questions here and uh, the first question is from dr anuj kumar so uh, and he has asked that how many cases in india who suffer from heart failure have iron deficiency and how many patients come back to normal values in what time as per your experience well this is a very important question very rightly asked and uh, in india what we know is that we do not have exact figures but what we interpolate extrapolate from our total population of about 1.2 billion we estimate that there are about 10 million patients who have heart failure rate to 10 million and out of these three fourths have iron deficiency and this is what is estimated which puts the figure at about somewhere between 5 to 7 million patients having iron deficiency and heart failure so they all need to be treated and they all need to be treated with intravenous iron not with oral iron and once you have treated them optimally so they do come back to their normal values over a period of after therapy with the iron whichever the total iron which you calculate and give or immediately they are back to their normal values the second question is by dr anil gar he says sir a patient diagnosed with covid 19 and have, have history of heart failure advice treatment in such patient well uh, the treatment of heart failure uh, does not change if the patient is suffering from covid 19 but one word of caution do not try and initiate new therapies in such patients we must uh, continue with their ongoing therapies and they should be managed optimally and one important thing which we must do in such patients is that there is an evidence which is coming that covid-19 infections are affecting the heart also primarily causing myocarditis and other problems so that needs to be taken care of and kept in mind and we must consider doing eco more frequently in such patients and taking up uh, bursting of heart failures also specifically when they have covid-19 infections there's another question for treatment of diabetic with heart failure patients sglt2 inhibitors can be given with army if yes what would be the safety management well uh, army and sglt2 inhibitors can be given and should be given and i give them very very frequently because both these drugs are independent they do not affect each other drug neither sglt2 inhibitor affects the army neither army affects the sglt2 inhibitor and the safety management is same as with any other heart failure patient there is a question by uh, dr lakhan singh and he asks giving army in diabetes patient is needed if patient is taking sglt2 yes this is a very relevant question and definitely all patients who are on sglt2 inhibitors and if you really want to treat them well should be given along with their army drugs army drugs help these patients on top of sglt2 also dr anand has asked a question that if a patient is showing good results with sidmus 100 and well accepted without any risk of hypo but he has borderline dp should we still insist in titrating those the answer is yes we must up titrate to 200 mg twice a day because we know that the best outcomes are seen with the maximum dose of 200 twice a day and it should be done Uh, the up titration should be done in these patients there then dr taneja has asked a very interesting question and he says that he has asked that did sglt2 show reverse remodeling in heart failure patients like army yes there is evidence from canada there is a study which is based on echocardiographic parameters which has shown this has been done with ampagliflozin and also there are a couple of them in pipeline which have shown that in patients 
uh, who are on SGLT2 inhibitors, they have also shown reverse remodeling like RNA. The another important question has been asked by Dr. Vineet Singh, how to manage patients with HFREF who have evidence of fluid retention? Well, mostly patients who come with HFREF come to us primarily with the fluid retention. And when uh, we do their physical examination, we find that they have pedal edema, raised veins, and S3, S4, and all the features of fluid retention. They should be cautioned about restricting the intake of liquids and typically i would say in patients with moderate heart failure to restrict themselves to 1.5 liters or 2 liters of liquids in 24 hours certain simple tricks like uh, daily weight record can help also in such patients we should use diuretics in these patients and uh, diuretics do improve quality of life significantly in many patients and also improve the outcomes so this is uh, the way we must treat these patients as far as fluid uh, retention is concerned. Another question has been asked, uh, what are the, what effects does ARNI have on levels of BNP and nt -proBNP? This is a very good question um, because we know that ARNI drug per se, we use it in heart failure and we use it in patients who have raised BNP and anti pro BNP. So, if a patient is given ARNI, the levels of BNP will increase because uh, the degradation of BNP is reduced. But the levels of anti pro BNP are not affected by ARNI at all. The levels of anti pro BNP are affected by treatment with ARNI, and if the heart failure improves, the anti pro BNP level goes down. So, in patients who are on ARNI, it is the anti pro BNP which tells us the correct picture rather than the BNP. So this is something which must be kept in mind while treating patients and while uh, ordering these tests, specifically the various uh, biomarkers such as anti pro BNP and BNP. And Dr. Ashish Raj has asked a question, how to manage hyperkalemia and HFREF patient with RV? So we need to treat hyperkalemia with HFREF in patients with RV as with any other patients on ACE inhibitors or ARB, it is the same way. The most commonly, the most common culprit is the MRAs and uh, the diet of the patient. So these two need to be adjusted. We must tell the patient that all the food items which are having increased amount of potassium, such as fruit juices, salads, uh, the almonds and the dry fruits, they should all be avoided. We must give them a whole list of food items which needs to be avoided, which have high potassium levels. So they should be avoided. And in many patients, we can down titrate the MRA dose also. So many times they are on a very high dosages of MRAs. So we can down titrate the dosages of MRA. And if the hyperkalemia is more, uh, you can use the various potassium binding agents, although we do not have the raisins available in India internationally, they are available. But I use uh, the K bind sachet in many such patients with very good effect and they are treated very well. Then another question by Dr. Jaswind Singh What LDL level you suggest in heart failure patients with diabetes and age above 60? If the patient ha is having heart failure due to coronary artery disease, then I'm certain I want the LDL less than 70. But if the patient doesn't have coronary artery disease or any evidence of atherosclerotic disease, whether it's coronary artery disease or CVD, then levels of 100 are good enough in these patients. Dr. V.K. Kohli has asked a question. Can SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure management uh, have new therapeutic prospects as compared to ARNI in de novo diabetic heart failure patients? Yes, definitely. SGLT2 inhibitors do have uh, good therapeutic prospects in heart failure like ARNI because they are now being used as predominantly as a heart failure drugs also. And I just now said that US FDA four days back has given approval to dapagliflozin to be used in all HFREF patients, even those without diabetes as a HFREF 
drug. Another question has been asked uh, by Dr. Mohit. He is asking that the dose does Sidmus show reverse cardiac remodeling? Yes, there have been studies to show reverse cardiac remodeling by the army group of drugs also there are experimental studies also there are studies based on echo which do show improvement in the echocardiographic parameters and we also at our center in gangaram hospital have documented in many patients reverse cardiac remodeling with the use of sidmus uh, group of drugs so dr abhishek has asked sir as you shared about dapa got recommendation uh, for hefref here Yes, as of now, DAPA has a recommendation to be used in HEFREF, irrespective of diabetes. But if patient has diabetes, you can use any of the three SGLT2. But if patient doesn't has diabetes, you can use DAPA according to the US FDA. The other gliflozin also have a class effect, and maybe it's just a matter of time when they have their ongoing uh, trial results. Like I am part of Emperor study, which is studying ampagliflozin in heart failure, both reduced and preserved. So when the results will be published, we would be knowing that whether we can use empagliflozin or not in these patients. So another question, sir, your choice now if a patient walks in for treatment. Well, my choice remains the same, which is guideline directed medical therapy and the pillars of therapy are use of ACE, ARB or ARNI. I prefer to use ARNI in patients upfront as early as possible use diuretics, use beta blockers, use MRAs in all my patients. And once I've achieved the optimum dose and the heart rate is not still controlled, then I use evabradine in such patients and would also like to use if the patient is diabetic as GLT2 inhibitors in all patients. And now we'll be using dapagliflozin in large majority of patients also. Dr. Lakhan Singh has asked that have any effect of sacabutril valsartan on aortic stiffness with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction? Well, there are small studies which have studied, but we do not have very large evidence on this indication. And also in uh, there are ongoing uh, studies with hypertension and aneurysm progression, which might answer in near future. Thank you so much for your questions. It was very nice to interact with all of you and as always, whenever we have such discussions, it is a two-way communication which always helps. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank Lupin for uh, coming forward and doing all these uh, webinars in this time of this pandemic of COVID. And uh, you are helping us to use this time in, uh, in a very good way I'm sharing our experiences with all our doctors and it, it has been nice to interact with all of you. Thank you so much.